Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have just a fabulous show coming right up with two very special guests. Our first guest today is Kristen Higgins, and she's here to share with us her new book, Good Luck With That. Now, Kristen is the New York Times, USA Today, Wall Street Journal, and Publishers Weekly best-selling author of 18 novels, which have been translated into more than two dozen languages. Her books have received dozens of awards and accolades, including starred reviews from Kirkus, the New York Journal of Books, Publishers Weekly, Library Journal, and Booklist. She is a five-time nominee for the Kirkus Prize for Best Work of Fiction. So join me in welcoming Kristen Higgins to the show. Thank you so much. Oh, what a joy it is to have you here, and my goodness, I loved your book. Once I picked it up, I could not put it down. For me, it was just, you know, there were parts of it that were just like, they would tug at your heart, and it really helps people to look at a lot of things in in a new light. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's definitely a book um, that takes the reader through a whole range of emotions. I always say I like you to ugly face cry and snort laugh while you're reading one of my books. So I'm well, glad that one. <laughs> Good. <laughs> that did happen. <laughs> And, you know, and I would love for you to, because most people know you, I mean, you're this, you you write novels that are about romance and, you know, and you've received huge accolades for your previous books. And then this book is more about kind of dealing with weight issues and friendship. Did you feel it was mm-hmm. a huge transition for this or or was it something that was easy for you? Well, I think this book was um, definitely something I was meant to write. Um, I had, this is my 18th novel, and I did start uh, writing romantic comedies. Um, and very quickly, I started embracing other aspects of of um, life into my books because while I I love the romance genre, it didn't feel um, like it was true for me to write just about. Um, heroes and heroines getting together. I wanted to write books that were about life and all the aspects of it, including romance um, and relationships. Uh, But this book, Good Luck With That, is special, I think, because it tackles a topic that is very difficult to deal with, and that is women, body size, and self-esteem. Yeah. Isn't that the truth? It seems like, you know, women, and I know men get this a little bit, but women are, we're just so bombarded with this day in and day out. And it, and depending on our parents, I mean, it could be something that we're groomed with just starting from a young age. Exactly. I mean, I was one of those kids who uh, was a happy, chubby toddler and didn't know there was anything wrong with that until my dear mother entered me into a beauty pageant and she entered me in with the full expectation that I would win and that her daughter was adorable. But I was actually the first kid booted off the stage in a really callous way. I mean, this was years ago, but the judge walked up and down and pointed at me and he said, you're out, you're too chubby. And I was four, you know, so I shamed at four. And And I remember that shock of realizing that I was somehow wrong in his eyes and that feeling of shame that immediately rose up and my mom lifted me off the stage and she was furious and and I'm sure she gave him a piece of her mind. But I felt like, oh, I didn't I didn't know this about me. I'm so embarrassed. And and I had very beautiful parents very slim and athletic siblings and it was uh it was hard you know it was hard to be the kid who had to shop in the other section of the store the husky section it was called and um and always feel like I needed to lose weight that I wasn't slim enough and 
And at every turning point of my life, when I started a new high school or, or when I was in the school play or when I went off to college or had a job, um, you know, it was always like, I, I should lose weight for this and things will go better, which, of course, isn't true. You know, life goes the way it goes and it's all about the effort that you put into it. But the messaging that we have, as you said, like we're bombarded with all these messages, um, my daughter and I were grocery shopping the other day and we were standing in, in line for checkout and we see this magazine that says, lose 20 pounds in one week. <laughs> and I thought, oh, and she said, how, how do you do that? You, do you cut off a leg? <laughs> and I said, it's probably less painful than what the magazine is going to tell you to do. You know, of course you can't lose 20 pounds of fat in a week. Um, without surgery and um, but also on this on this magazine cover was the best chocolate cake ever (laughs) you know so we're we get these messages of look a certain way be a certain size and also eat food eat a lot of food food is always available in America we have you know fast food open 24 hours we have grocery stores where you can call an Uber to go pick up your Chick-fil-A and bring it to your house. And it's it's really hard to maintain a good attitude about your size if you're not that, you know, 1% who looks a certain way. Well, even the 1% struggle <laughs> with looking a certain way. You know, it's- That's true, yeah. I mean, if you have a personal trainer and the only thing you have to worry about is how you look, you know, then, hey, you know, that it might be a little bit easier than the average bear. But most most people do struggle with some type of body image. Yes, I think that's true. And I, I think it's true for, for men as well, um, not to the degree that women get that message. But um, – I know for teenage boys, it can be just as painful to, you know, not be thin enough or tall enough or or feeling too tall. Um, And uh, in Good Luck With That, I do have a character, a 14-year-old boy, who is dealing with the same insecurities that um, his 35-year-old aunt is dealing with, you know, that I don't look the right way and people won't like me because of it. And you know, for both of them, it's an insidious message. Um, You know, actually for Georgia, uh, she's constantly told by her mother, you know, you're too big, you're you're too fat, you have 30 pounds to go, 100 pounds to go, I'm so embarrassed that you're this size. Um, But I think the messaging is all around us, no matter what kind of upbringing you have. Uh, Marley in the story has a very loving family. and, And she's significantly overweight, but she never loses weight in the book. The book is not about losing weight. It's about coming to find a way to be kind to yourself and to appreciate yourself and shut off those negative messages that you can hear from just about every corner. Well, and I love how your book, it has the three main characters, Emerson, Georgia, and Marley, they actually meet at a weight loss camp for teens. Right. And so right. there's like even this like pressure on them to like be a certain way or look a certain way and how that friendship really develops from there. Yeah, I think more than anything, the book is about female friendship and the power that it holds when you surround yourself by uh, with the right people. Because um, when you have your your close friends and your family of choice, it, it makes life so much easier because you have people who would say, you're wonderful. I, I, I love this about you. I love that about you. I value you. You know, you're, you're one of my favorite people. And Georgia and Marley have that. Um, they have it with Emerson to a lesser degree because she lives in a, in a different part of the United States. Um, and they, they help themselves through this journey of, of self-acceptance. Um, and I think what I love the most about the book is, is this idea of treat yourself the way you would treat your best friend. When you're feeling like, you know, you're beating up on yourself, imagine that your best friend is saying that to you and what you would say to her. You'd say, of course, you're wonderful. 
shut up. <laughs> you know, you're fabulous. And, and don't you know how, how much you have to offer? I think that we women are very hard on ourselves and, and that needs to stop. We need to focus more on the qualities that really matter. Well, you deal with some very real-life issues in this book. When we talk about weight and friendships and just self-acceptance, you know, you also talk about food addictions. And, yes. You know, that has a very um, early and sad ending, you know. Right. Emerson, um, in the chap- first chapter of the book, dies as um, a result of her, her food addiction, which is more than overeating. It she she weighs more than 600 pounds. She's housebound. Um, she has an enabler in her life who who keeps supplying her with food. And just like any form of addiction, whether it's um, heroin or alcohol or um, anorexia, it's not easy or pretty for her to deal with this. And it's shocking to her friends when they see her after five years you know, how deep in her addiction she is and the physical toll that that's taken on her. And, um, and, you know, this kind of um, obesity is becoming more and more common in America. The deck is stacked against us with, in terms of the food industry and the constant availability of food. But I wanted to, um, I wanted to show a person of Emerson's size Because I think, first of all, there's not a lot of them in fiction. You know, you don't see a lot of people of that size. And I think a lot of us see a person who weighs that much and you think, you know, why did you do this to yourself? How did it get so out of control? And we're very judgmental and not always to people of that size. So... I wanted to represent her as a person who is multifaceted, intelligent, kind. Um, she's also very shy and, and lonely. She's suffered losses through her life, like everyone has, some trauma. And her comfort is food. And that's true for so many of us, but there comes a point where she she becomes a true food addict. And I spent three months researching um, weight issues before I started writing this book because I knew this was such a, um, a complex issue both on the science and health side and on the emotional side. So I wanted it to be more than my own experiences as a, a chubby kid, an overweight kid growing up and struggling with my own self-esteem. Um, I wanted to really educate myself. So I talked to everyone. <laughs> I talked to doctors. I talked to um, uh, people in Overeaters Anonymous. I, I read articles from CNN and the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. And I um, watched documentaries and I read memoirs. And um, uh, it, it was really eye-opening to, to the idea of, you know, people of size, this is not about food. It's about a wound that they have um, that they're trying to sell or cure by eating. And um, and I'm not talking about, you know, people who are simply overweight. I'm talking about people who have kind of crossed the line into what is medically and very heartlessly called super morbid obesity. Um, where food is is becoming a a threat to their lives, mm-hmm. um, and that was that was really eye opening, and um, I think it certainly made me more compassionate and knowledgeable about how someone does get there. And in Good Luck with That, Emerson addresses that. She says, you know, people look at me and they say, how did it get? How did you get this way? And I, and she says, I, I'll tell you. First, it starts, you know, when you're little. And um, and I think that's a really raw and honest uh, look into how someone gets to be that size. Yeah. Well, and also the emotional pieces that go with that, you know, um, from some of the reading I've, <clears throat> excuse me, I've done on this topic, it seems that, 
you know, when we do get to different sizes, it's because we're either trying to pat ourselves from something that's going on in life, you know, we're self-soothing. It, there's all, mm-hmm. a whole lot of emotional aspects that go with that. Right. And food is, you know, it's the only addiction that you, you have to keep indulging. You have to eat, you know. And um, it, it's not like smoking where you can give up cigarettes forever um, or alcohol. You can't be sober from eating, you know. Um, you have to eat to live. And and I I definitely believe in health at any size and um and I also acknowledge that not everyone is healthy at any size on either end of the spectrum. You know, you can be too thin, you can be too overweight, and your body is going to feel the effects of that. Um, but you're right; it's it, there's an emotional component to it, and a loneliness, um, I think, to being a food addict. Um, now, there are a lot of women in fiction represented as overweight and completely self-accepting, loving their bodies, appreciating them, um, you know, finding people who are not judgmental, who appreciate their bodies as well. And I love those characters, um, but we're not all there. So good luck with that really explores the journey to getting there, to getting to self-acceptance, appreciation of your body exactly as it is right now today, not saying like, well, in in 50 pounds, I can start feeling good about myself. It's about saying, I'm going to start today. I'm going to make a concerted effort to appreciate myself today. And um, it's notable that no one loses weight in this book. Well, uh, Georgia is losing weight, but she's got a health problem that she's ignoring um, which I think is another very common thing. People do like, well, I feel really terrible, but hey, I'm losing weight. And um, and she eventually addresses her health issue and has to gain some weight um, and kind of find that happy place where her body wants to be. You know, I, food is such a wonderful part of life, and I personally want to enjoy my meals and if I indulge sometimes, I want to feel that was worth it. It was so delicious. And I want to take care of myself at the same time. So I think that the idea of like being on a lifelong diet is ridiculous. Um, I think that, you know, there's a balance in everything. And each person has to find it for herself. That is so true. And I just love how your book addresses you know, it just takes this hard look at just weight in general and what women um, have to go through and, and young girls. And it's interesting. You're so right when we talk about, you know, if, if I lose 50 pounds and I can wear this dress and maybe start dating again. It's like right. it's, it's a, um, a barrier that keeps us from living life. Mm-hmm. Right. And in the beginning of Good Luck With That, um, Emerson you know, she's in the hospital, she calls her friends down and she gives them something to be opened after her funeral because she knows she's not going to make it. She's put herself here. She's, you know, accepted the fact that her life is ending. And she gives them this list that they made when they were teenagers at weight loss camp where none of them loses weight, you know. I mean, they lose a little bit, they gain it back. And um, it, the list is called Things to Do When We're Skinny. And it's this list filled with adolescent longing and this idea of when we're thin, then we'll be able to do these things. And so Georgia and Marley decide we're going to do the list. We promised Emerson we would, but we're not going to lose weight to do it. We're just going to do it now because it's exactly as you said, don't wait to lose 50 pounds to start dating. Start dating now. You know, don't put conditions on yourself of like you're not good enough because of your size. Just start now. Don't wait. You know, I I love this um the saying that the best way to get bikini to get a bikini body is to buy a bikini. You know, it <laughs> doesn't matter what size you are. You just uh, you know, you just if you want to wear a bikini, wear a bikini, you know. You don't need to be a certain size for that. Um, that's the truth. So, 
that's kind of what the list is about. It's about going for it now and and acknowledging that you have value just the way you are without conditions. That, that's such an important life lesson regardless where we are in our lives and what size we are, what what financial status we are. It, you know, none of that stuff really matters when we get down to it. Right, and, right. Yeah, and, you know, and it's interesting. When you were doing that three months of research, was there something that really surprised you when you were going through all that? Yes, um, and that's a great question. What surprised me is how hard our bodies fight to protect fat because fat does a lot of good for us. You know, there's, there's a reason we gain weight when we're going through puberty. There's a reason we gain weight when we're going through menopause. Um, you know, your body knows a lot about about what it needs. And it's been trained to value fat because as we became homo sapiens, uh, we had to survive long winters of deprivation. And so your body is programmed to keep fat on, which is why diets almost inevitably fail. You know, you can lose weight, but can you keep it off? Your body is going to find a way to, to get it back. It's going to fight really hard. So unless you're incredibly disciplined and are willing to measure out half a cup of, you know, whole grain rice every day for your, for your meals and that kind of thing, then, you know, your body's going to settle where it wants to be. And um, ironically, the best way to lose weight if you are medically in need of losing weight is to stop trying, is to just stop dieting and start doing food as something that you need and can enjoy. And when you stop using it as punishment and reward, find yourself in a better place. So that was a big surprise to know that, you know, the, the fat has a lot of value. We, you know, we, we hold up these images to women and, and girls of these lean, fat-free women um, or women who are curvy but in a very specific way. You know, if you're J-Lo curvy or you're Beyonce curvy, that's okay. But, you know, if you weigh 50 pounds over what your doctor says you're supposed to weigh, that's supposedly not okay. And, um, but that, that kind of lean woman image that we're given over and over is very unrealistic. It's a very small percentage of the population who has that body and can keep that body. And to know that your fat is, is doing something good for your body was really eye opening. And it was a relief, you know, it was like, oh, so it's okay that I have this, you know, this, these soft parts, these fleshy parts, you know, um, that's not the worst thing in the world. Okay. I guess third time's a charm. Are you still there? Yep. I still am. Okay. I am so sorry. So, uh, I cannot, where did I lose you? Um, well, why don't we start with, we were talking about what surprised you. Okay. In this. So why don't we start from there? And I'm so sorry. That's okay. These things happen. Um, what surprised me in researching was learning the value of fat in your physiology. Um, you know, when we're when we're young girls and we go through puberty, uh, we gain weight. There's a reason for that. You know, it's to help in fertility. It's to it's to bring us to that phase of life. When we go through menopause, we gain weight because fat produces hormones that our bodies aren't making in other ways. Fat produces our, our bones as we age because, you know, if we fall, it will cushion us more. There's a reason that we, we keep weight on. You know, the reason that it's so hard to lose fat is because fat serves a purpose. And as we, as we evolved into Homo sapiens, um, our bodies learned to hoard fat to protect against the famine times, the hard winters. And um, so when you go on a diet, you can lose weight, but your body's really sneaky. It's going to find a way to get that back, which is why 99% of diets fail long term. So ironically, what I learned was the best way to lose weight, if you if you 
you know, need to lose weight for medical reasons, the best way to do it is to stop viewing food as punishment and reward, to just enjoy it, and and you will moderate after you learn not to eat for comfort or boredom, that kind of thing. When you're just eating to enjoy food, it's it's more likely that you will drop some weight. And it's just, it's so interesting because here's the diet industry, a billion of dollars we spend every year to lose weight and scientists are saying it's like yeah you know really if you just just eat to kind of be good to yourself and uh and it's okay to indulge once in a while uh, because I always think you know I don't want to live in a world where I can't eat pasta (laughs) (laughs) I think that, you know, when you, I'm not going to eat pasta three times a day, but when I do, I'm really going to enjoy it. And um, so the best way to lose weight is to stop trying to lose weight and let your body tell you what it needs, listen to it, honor it, appreciate it, and stop using food as punishment or reward. And I, I so appreciate that you share that because I think a lot of times people, they're just kind of stuck where I should always have my 18-year-old body or be a certain size all the time that they don't realize the body has these um, certain functions and it's designed to work a certain way. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, and, you know, what's really interesting, I know that there have been studies done that talk about um, when people are considered obese, just the kind of um, just the kind of treatment they get, they're really blamed for their weight, and it, there's not a whole mm-hmm. lot of compassion. With reading your book, it feels like it offers the reader an opportunity to look at what other people go through who are struggling with weight issues, and maybe they can develop that sense of compassion. Thank you. Yes, I. That was very important to me. Um, it's why I wrote the character of Emerson, and the reader knows her through her journal entries throughout the book. Um, to to see her as a whole person, and not just see her as a fat person. Um, and I think that you know she has people in her life who who appreciate her, and who who are kind to her. Um, and I've gotten so many letters and notes, um, emails, posts, you know, tweets saying, I, I see that I'm ashamed to admit I did judge people of a certain size. And, and I'm not going to do that anymore because, you know, you forget that people are more than their size. You, you judge them. You make assumptions about them. And we would never do that to someone in a wheelchair you know, said like, well, what did you do to um, to paralyze yourself? That was really dumb. You know, we're much more compassionate to other kinds of addiction, uh, disabilities. Um, you know, we we tend to, they say that fat is the last acceptable discrimination. And I really wanted to show how a character lives through that and the toll that it takes on her and how, the cruelty that, that is leveled at her. Um, how it affects her. So I'm really, I'm really proud of the fact that people have been saying, you know, I feel so much more compassion and empathy now that I've sort of journeyed with this fictional character. Yeah, it allows them to kind of walk a mile in somebody else's shoes and kind exactly. of think twice before they kind of lash out or think negatively. You know. Right. Right. I, I really felt your book had a healing component in it for people who maybe are struggling with their weight and also, like how we've been talking about, for people who probably just don't have a clue what it's like to be someone who struggles with their weight. Did you feel that it had some kind of healing for you as well? It did. It was, you know, it's a very cathartic book to write. It was kind of, you know, ripping off the the scabs um, for my own self and reinforcing that message of whatever your demon is, you know, whether you think you're too fat or too thin or, or too tall or, or uh, too dumb or too nasty, whatever it is, that 
that at the end of the day, you're a human with value. And for me, it was ripping off those scabs so that the wounds could finally heal, admitting that I have at times been really bad to myself, really judgy. Um, For me, it definitely was a size issue and feeling wrong in my own body. And writing this book really did allow me to to get through that and to to feel at peace with myself, to appreciate myself for, for who I am, what I do, how I am with other people, and um, and really get past that that idea that I'm supposed to look a certain way or be a certain size. And I, I want to say, personally, I threw out all my Spanx. <laughs> after after writing this, I'm like, you know what? I am how I am, and I'm I'm tired of putting myself in squishy undergarments to pretend that I'm I'm not. So, um, yeah, so that was a, a personal triumph on a small it's scale. A modern but. day corset, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, Dina, I gotta tell you, you're a little sneaky. You know, most people are like, well, she writes all these love books and their romance, but this is also very much a love book as well because it's about being in love with ourselves and having that Mm self-acceptance. So, you know, um, many people may not see that initially, but it's, I I love how you've kind of stayed true to, to your theme as a writer. Thank you. Yeah. I, you know, there is, there are love, love stories in this book for, for all three women. And, um, you know, some of it has to do with, for Georgia, um, she had a wonderful husband who loved her unconditionally and thought her, she was beautiful and desirable and funny and intelligent, really appreciated her, but she wasn't in a space where she could believe that because of the way she grew up with this super critical mother and, and cruel brother and just feeling inferior because that's when you're raised that way, it's really hard to shake. And so she ends up divorced from the love of her life. She sabotages their marriage because she's just so afraid if he knew the real her, and she I'm using air quotes, then he wouldn't love her. And, of course, he does know the real her. She's the one who doesn't. And so she needs to learn to appreciate herself and love herself before she can really accept that kind of love. Um, so Raphael is a character in the book who is, I think, you know, absolutely wonderful. And, and I also think he's like a lot of men where he doesn't care nearly as much about George's size as she does. Mm -hmm. And for Marley, um, she's settling in a relationship in the beginning of the book. She's saying like, well, you know, this is good enough. And, and he's really great on other levels. And the fact that he doesn't, you know, really acknowledge me as his girlfriend. I'm just kind of a booty call. You know, I I can work with that. I can get past that. I can kind of manipulate him into being my boyfriend. And um, and she starts to see what she deserves. And for Marley, it's interesting. She's always so um, concerned about being judged that she doesn't realize she's a little judgmental too. And um, to to one of the characters especially. So, yeah, there's definitely love stories in the book um, and the wonderful family of um, the DeFelice family, Marley's family, is this big, loving Italian family. Um, George's bond with her nephew, I think, is one of the most beautiful parts of the book. Um, so it's got all of the elements that I think my my readers will expect from me and then just that much more. And it's been really wonderful to hear from readers saying, like, I've always loved your books, but this one, wow. You know, you really went next <laughs> level on us. So I'm I'm really proud of that. And um and if you know, if readers haven't read me yet, I think that, you know, this is a great place to start. Oh, it, it most definitely is. You know, and Kristen, I really loved Good Luck With That. I thought it was a fabulous book. And, you know, thank you so much for taking the time to share it with us today. Where can people connect with you and be part of your community? Sure. Um, the best place is my website, KristenHiggins.com, and all my social media links are there. I have a newsletter. 
Um, I have uh, Facebook presence, Twitter, Instagram, all those, all the, all the usual suspects. Mm-hmm. You're you're everywhere, which is perfect. <laughs> yes. They can connect with you. I know your book is available at Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and of course all major retailers. You know, and all indie yourself. bookstores. Oh, you gotta love that. You gotta support. Gotta indie love the indie. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Well, and thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today, Kristen. It was such a pleasure. Thank you, Marianne. Well, on that note, we are going to pause here for a minute. We've been speaking with Kristen Higgins, author of Good Luck With That. Again, you can visit her website at kristenhiggins.com. And her book is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and of course, all indie bookstores. We are going to pause here for a quick break. And we'll be right back after these messages. Internationally recognized and award-winning author Judy Goodman works and teaches outside the box of limited thinking. Working with people from every walk of life, her goal is to empower you to be the best you can be, no matter what the challenge is. Born with the gift of seeing beyond our normal vision, she has an extraordinary gift of working with every challenge. Teaching beyond conventional wisdom, her work is described as life-changing. Visit JudyGoodman.com. That's JudyGoodman.com. There comes a moment when you realize you're somewhere special. When you discover that each beautiful creature that you see has been rescued from a life of absolute horror and brought to this incredibly free place, here is where their lives were forever changed and where yours will as well. Discover over 500 tigers, bears, and lions at the brand new visitor center at the Wild Animal Sanctuary just outside Denver. For more information, visit wildanimalsanctuary.org. Discover true freedom at the Wild Animal Sanctuary. Have you ever had the sense that your thoughts might actually be doing something? Ancient secrets of manifesting have been masterfully revealed in the award-winning book Manifesting 123 by Ken Elliott. For the first time, the author's experiences and stories in this book describe exactly how your thoughts can create anything. You've been doing this all your life, but it's never been fully explained for you until now. Visit Manifesting123.com for more information today. Manifesting123.com There are nearly 2 million Americans living with amputation. Many live right here in San Antonio. Becoming an amputee can be scary, frustrating, isolating, but there's no reason to feel alone. The San Antonio Amputee Foundation is here to help support you and guide you toward resources such as home and car modifications and even prosthetic limbs. For more information or to make a donation, visit saamputee.org. We'll help you live a full, active life, one step at a time. San Antonio Amputee Foundation, healing limbs, hearts, and and souls. Welcome back to Moments with Marianne. I am so delighted to be introducing our next guest. She is just such an inspiration. Today we have with us Nicola Taggart, and she's sharing with us her new book, Calm the Chaos Journal, A Daily Practice for a More Peaceful Life. Nicola is a life, leadership, and love success strategist, coach, and speaker. For the past 15 years, she has helped hundreds of business owners, executives, and emerging leaders increase their confidence and strengthen their connections in all areas of their life. Nicola believes that true success starts as an inside job and that the more clear, calm, and centered we are, the better we are able to lead from love, and leave a legacy that makes a difference. So let's welcome to the show, Nicola Taggart. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, what a joy it is to have you here, and I'm so glad we're spending this time together to talk about your new book. I mean, I I know it's not what people think as a traditional book, it's a journal, but my goodness, yes. it, I felt that is really profound. Great. <laughs> I'm hoping so. I mean, it's very, very simple. Um, but what I have found from my own use and using it with clients and having family and friends test it out is that people find that um, it can be profound and transformational in the simplicity. 
Oh, that's uh, exactly, I think, what most people are looking for, something that's like, you know, not so involved, but at the same time, it'll ask these simple questions that help move them forward. Yes. So I have to ask, you know, how did you even get started on this path? Because you're known, uh, you're, you do leadership and success coaching, you do consulting, so you've been working in this arena for some time. I have. Yeah, over 15 years. Mm-hmm. And how so how did I get started, started with the yeah. Calm the Chaos concept? Well, do you know, just on the path that you're on, you know, was it kind of like you always knew that this is the way you were going to, you know, you know uh, approach life as being a leader in, in helping people with your coaching? Yeah, I mean, how I got into it, it was not a planned path, um, you know, which I find more and more in the work that I do that, for a lot of people, the unplanned path is, is oftentimes um, the more enjoyable. Um, and so for me, you know, I, I, I didn't have a plan to sort of be in leadership development and personal development um, specifically. I did know when I was in high school, I was involved in leadership. I was in, you know, on the student body council and I was naturally drawn to being in leadership roles myself, and I was actually very naturally drawn um, to connecting with adults that were in leadership positions as well. Didn't really understand what that meant at that time, but um, there was something about it that I that I clearly was drawn to. And I did know when I was in high school, I remember saying, you know, someday I'm going to own my own business. I had no idea what that was, but for some reason, um, I just, it felt right to kind of have that freedom to to lead my own path and to kind of be in charge of my own thing. Um, but then fast forward, you know, when I went to college, I, I kind of did the the typical thing that I think a lot of people in their 20s do as they're in college, or maybe they're not, but just trying to figure out kind of what's next for them and uh, where they're going to go in their career and, you know, very much felt like I had to pick the thing um, and struggled with that and ended up choosing um, journalism and communications with an emphasis in public relations because, honestly, it sounded very sexy. (laughs) Um, And 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 got into that and kind of started doing some work in that um, and realized that I didn't love it, but what I did love was sort of naturally being um, somebody that people would come to for advice and direction, and I didn't know at the time that it was coaching, but it was. Um, I would find myself in the CEO's office many times just – being a sounding board for her and bouncing around ideas and giving some some um, thoughts that I had on on people development and organizational development. So I kind of stumbled into it just by being naturally myself and kind of doing stuff that I like doing that was not a specific part of my job. Um, and then that led me on the path of, gosh, you know, there's people that do this for a living, and how awesome would that be for me to be able to sort support people um, in leadership positions, both personally and professionally. So I think that's where kind of their switching point was for me in terms of how I, I really got into doing what I love is realizing that there's a lot of support out there for people in their professional development. Um, and in leadership development. But what I love is sort of that cross-section between helping people really be their best and live their best life personally and professionally. And over time, as I worked with more and more leaders, I found that they would be, you know, kind of outwardly successful um, professionally, but really struggling personally, struggling with their own... um, mindset, their own confidence, um, their courage kind of to do things that they really wanted to do, really struggling in their relationships, um, in their marriages, in their relationships with their kids. And so I started getting more into supporting um, people in leadership positions and emerging leaders and really how to have the best of both worlds. And that starts with being able to kind of calm the chaos in your internal and external life enough that you can get really clear about what matters 
for you and and then take those actions those small daily actions like you'll you know you see in the journal um, as well as sort of those bigger courageous actions but it all has to start from the place of getting calm enough for that clarity you know to, to show up for you Is that the long long answer <laughs> That's okay because we like hearing about the long answer. We, we would like to hear how people transition in their lives from one thing to another and end up finding their purpose. And you obviously have because you know if you have CEOs coming to you asking for advice, which doesn't really you know the CEOs I've worked with in the past would not really do that. Yeah, it really says that you have this natural knack for having people come to you, you know, wanting to have either that soundboard or someone that's going to give them some really clear advice. Yeah, and I think that, you know, as I look back, again, you know, when I think about, and even when I coach people about finding their own passion and, and purpose, and one of the things I say is don't don't expect it to be just one thing. It doesn't have to be just one thing. Um, but I do, I you know, I, I, I see that as um, little um, points of giving me some evidence about I was on the right path because that is just naturally what would happen and it's what I would naturally love doing. You know, like people wouldn't have to pay me to come in and sit with them and and hear what they're challenged with and their struggles with and, and brainstorm and talk about ideas. I, I would do that with them. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell anybody that. Um, no, it's just because I love it, and um, mm-hmm. so I think following that that those little breadcrumbs, you know, has definitely gotten me to where I am. About oh yeah, this is who I am. This is what I'm meant to do, and I do it in different capacities, um, but it's clearly what brings me a lot of joy. Well, it's easy to see that. And so when you started to develop Calm the Chaos, you know, the book that we're talking about, the journal, was that based off of the clients that you were working with, they were asking some similar questions or having some of the same kind of hiccups? Now, honestly, it was created initially for myself. I was in a place, and, and I first started with this concept you know, easily going on. Let's see, my my daughter is 13, so it probably uh, 10 years ago, and I was in a place of you know probably anything but calm, <laughs> in the midst of a lot of chaos. Um, you know, had my had started my business, um, had my uh, my stepdaughter who was young, my daughter who was a baby, um, then added my son to the mix. So I had three kids, you know, at various ages, running a business. My husband has a full-time, you know, busy career. Um, we don't have family that lives close by. So just juggling all of that, you know, I was looking for something for myself to bring some structure to what I was reading and learning and studying about around health and happiness habits. And, you know, the, there's a ton of research out there and information. This isn't, I always say this about the, the journal, this isn't new information. It really was kind of inspiration for pulling together some various components that I had read and researched about that I felt like I wanted to incorporate into my life in a regular ra- uh, regular way, in a regular habit. And I was struggling to do that because I think when you're in a place of feeling overwhelmed and stressed and things feel chaotic, it's so easy to just operate just automatically and, and not uh, intentionally. And so I created the structure myself for myself and started using it and tweaking it and then found that um, that it was really helpful in just getting into that groove and bringing some of that daily practice into my life in an intentional way. And as I saw it shifting my own life, I then started sharing it with clients. Um, and that time it was just a printed off piece of paper you know, with the questions. Um, and then I thought, you know, I could really see this being a valuable tool, and I, I kind of self-created it, self-published it, I guess, for um, clients to use, and then had them testing it out and got positive results or positive responses and positive results. So that it actually started for myself, um, and then I started to share it out with the world. What are some of the 
like key markers that someone would know, like I need to call my chaos, you know? Is it, <laughs> <laughs> well, I like definitely, I would say feeling, feeling dissatisfied just in, in life in general. I mean, I, I think there was a point in which, again, sort of outwardly, I, people would probably look and be like, oh, she's got it all. She's got this successful business. She's got an involved husband. She's got, you know, her, her kids, like, the outward impression from people may seem positive, but if internally there's a feeling of of dissatisfaction, confusion, a lot of times I had a really hard time focusing my attention during the day. I would feel like, um, you know, I wasn't showing up and giving my best to my family, and then I also would get into work and not able to focus and kind of give my best to that. So it was just a lot of, you know, feeling of dis satisfaction and like I I wasn't in my best place. I wasn't really fully shining my my light in any area of, of my life in a way that I felt good about. Um, so I think, you know, the feelings of stress and overwhelm and inability to really focus, trying to do too much. I mean, I work a lot with women and, and one of the key things that comes up a lot is trying to to do 100% in every area of your life, which is just really a recipe for um, kind of losing your mind and and a lot of chaos. And that's part of the journal, too, is getting really intentional about how you want to be in the world each day and how you want to show up and really what is it that matters most for you to focus on that day, um, that if you try to do it all every single day, you're not going to actually have the experience that you want to have. People aren't going to have the experience of you that you want them to have. Mm-hmm. I would agree with you on that. It, it ends up being a really interesting um, thing because we end up spreading our energy so thin that we really have nothing to give anybody, including ourselves. Yes. Right. So we think that we're giving our, giving of ourselves to other people um, and that that's a positive thing. Uh, but it is that that whole idea of when you take some time to fill yourself up first, take care of yourself, be intentional about where you give your attention and your energy, um, the experience for you and the people around you will be different. And and that's kind of at the heart of even why I start from this place with people that I work with is that you know I'm often working with people who really want to leave a legacy in in both their personal life and their professional life. They want to be remembered in a positive way. And yet when we start talking, what comes out is that if they continue to operate in the way that they are currently, the experience that people are having with them is actually not the memories they want them to have. Um, And a lot of times that falls into their personal life. They'll say, you know, I'm, I'm... doing all these things successfully professionally, uh, I feel like I'm succeeding, but if we talk about, well, what are the memories that your kids will have of you, uh, what, you know, when you look back on this time and, and, you t- and you think about the marriage and the type of marriage you're having, it, are you leaving the legacy in that way that you want to have? And a lot of times the answer is no. So the journal becomes a, a way for you to kind of refocus on doing the simple things that are often hard for people to do to take care of themselves on a regular basis, which are not actually, it doesn't have to take that much time. It can be a short amount of moving your body. It can be, um, you know, just doing something small for yourself during the day that brings you pleasure. It's, you know, eating well and practicing gratitude and those simple things that we find when you do them on a consistent basis absolutely impact the energy that you bring to the table. Well, I'm so glad you said that because I think a lot of times when people feel like I need to make changes in my life, it can feel very overwhelming to yes. them. In your experience, does it really take a long time or can it be done pretty quickly? Well, I, I think there's two sides to that answer. I the the things that are in the journal are like you've seen the journal it's simple right they're relatively simple things what i would say is that those changes can happen right away it it's the, doing those consistent small habits in your life can have a huge impact what i think is interesting is that when i see people 
start from this place, which I say is kind of from the inside out, right? So a lot of times we think of like, I'm dissatisfied in my life. I need to make some big change. And sometimes that is the case, but um, this is kind of this less dramatic, you know, declaration of I'm going to make this big change or I've got this big goal. It's really kind of starting from the inside out so that you can get some space in your life um, to be more clear about who you are and what's important to you and aligning with that. So what I'll see happen when I'm working with people is that we'll use this as the foundation, as a starting point, and they don't notice like this big dramatic change, you know, in day two or day five, but over time, they will start sharing with me about this difference about how they feel and the way, the the relationships that they're having and just kind of their overall outlook on life. And they'll start talking about it, not even realizing necessarily the change that's occurred, but because of the lens that I have and kind of this vantage point, you know, I'll stop them and say, do you realize that when we were just talking a month ago or three months ago, this is how you were feeling versus this is how you are now? So it's it, it's kind of this gradual accumulation um, that I would say is not this grand um it's not a grand gesture. It's not a, a, a grand declaration. It's just kind of this this progression where all of a sudden somebody will go, "Wow, you know, my perspective on life is different. My the way I show up for my family is different. Um, the way I feel in terms of just even productivity, right? Of like I may be really busy all the time, but I'm not actually feeling like I'm getting done what I need to. All of a sudden, that they'll notice like, "Oh my gosh, that feels different for me." Yeah, it can see the changes that are taking place. Even, and it's interesting, even when they're small, it's usually when they seem, at least for me, it's like, oh, well, that's not a thing anymore. That's kind of cool. Yes. <laughs> right, which is when it becomes really kind of a, a ritual or a habit in your life that you've now integrated in. You don't have to put so much thought behind it. The journal is a way to help you get that going because it is challenging. Again, these are simple things, but for so many people that I talk to, it's like they know these are things that they should be doing. Again, that information and research is out there, um, but it's getting into that habit and their routine. And I think that um, what with the journal, and I love the you know the package that Chronicle has put it in because it's so beautiful to have by your bedside table or in your bag. But it gives just this sort of nice ritual and richness to that that daily practice. Um, and I've had people ask me before, like, are you going to put it into an app? And my response has always been no, because I find that there is power in opening a book and putting pen to paper and being disengaged from the technology that can serve us in a lot of ways, but it's also adding to why people are feeling a lot of chaos in their life. So I find that the practice of having the physical book is is very powerful and even if you don't end up doing it every single day having that reminder and knowing when things are starting to feel more chaotic or stressful that you have a tool to go back to to kind of help bring you back on track yeah to bring things back to where you, you know where we really want them to be because you know living in um live in a life where you feel like you don't even have enough time for yourself. Yes. It, it's just, it's a horrible place to be. Right. And there's so much coming at us all the time, right? And it just keeps increasing and increasing. And I, I, I think that one of the most important things that we can do in our life and that if you're a parent that you can be instilling in your, your children is, is having some space in your day to be thoughtful, to be grateful, to be intentional. And it doesn't have to take very long. I mean, that's one of the things that I think people have loved about this journal is that they can do it in 10 minutes, right, at the end of the day. It doesn't have to be this long journaling process. Uh, But that giving yourself some space to just catch your breath and reconnect to what's important to you and self-care is such a – I don't know, it's such a grounding, for me, such a grounding process. And I absolutely can tell when I haven't been doing this on a regular basis, Um, just with the way I feel in my life and the way I respond to the people around me and how much I actually feel productive in the day. And then that's like a little 
red flag that says, okay, <laughs> time to go get back on track. Yeah, time time to, you know, and the, the, journal, the journal's really good for that because it helps just kind of outline, hey, these are things I need to be thinking about, not just for me, but what I also appreciated, you had in there acts of kindness that we did for somebody mm-hmm. else. And I'd love for you to share why you incorporated that in the journal and why you felt that it was really important. Well, so that came from um, various research and, again, things that I was reading. And I, I believe it's from The Happiness Habits from Sean Anker, uh, and which I, I highly recommend reading the book, or he's got a great video on YouTube. Uh, but there were, you know, definitely some very specific things that he had outlined based on research that that he's found contribute to increasing people's feelings of happiness. And uh, uh, originally, that one wasn't in the journal. But what I found is that on the days that I that I did an act of kindness, that I was conscious about doing something for somebody else. And and I don't mean taking care of other people's stuff that's not my responsibility. I think we all do enough of that already and we're trying to pull that back. But I'm talking about, you know, that that momentary sort of inspiration uh, to do something for somebody else, especially somebody that you may not even know, you may not ever see again, um, that the days that I would do that, the hit that I would get in terms of how it made me feel was very powerful. And so I did end up incorporating that into the final version because I think I got why that has shown up in the research. And I also think that just given kind of where we are in history right now and the way people are feeling, that if part of my legacy is helping people on a regular basis find ways to infuse more kindness into the world, even in that small way, because they are reminded of it, like, oh, I'm going to be making note of this tonight. I mean, that's part of the the process with the journal, too, is that you start to to actually look through this lens of I'm going to be kind of checking in on myself at the end of the day. So without even thinking about it, not that you're going around calculated with, mm-hmm. oh, I need to go do my one act of kindness, but I think it, you, you just kind of get into this groove of realizing that these things are now becoming a part of my life and that that feels good when I either find ways to bring kindness into the world and do an act of kindness. Or I know I talked with people where they would say they would have the inspiration to do something for somebody, like buy the person's coffee behind them um, or hold hold the door open for somebody, and they wouldn't do it because they were too busy, right? They'd have the the inspiration, but they wouldn't actually follow through for some reason. And this kind of gives you a little bit of a push to just go with the inspiration and take the moment to do it. Do you feel that they're too busy or maybe there's some fear tied into that as well? That's a good question. I I think it's probably both. I think it's that people are operating so fast right now that there's sort of this mentality of I just don't have time or you just kind of you have the hit of inspiration but you move on. Um, and then I do think that there's a level of, of fear. I mean, I don't – that's not something I've, like, tested or asked people about, but I think there's a level of discomfort right now about, um, you know, people getting invo- involved in other people's stuff. And I think the way that we operate now with technology and social media that, you know, people think that they're more connected, but when it actually comes to, like, real-life interactions with people, they're way less um courageous, I think, in, in sort of taking those actions. Yeah, they're able to, it's almost like they need permission going, gosh, you know, I have permission to do this now. Yes. <laughs> yes, this is a good thing. Like it's, you know, it, I, and I don't, again, I don't know exactly what that fear is, but I do see this hesitation. And I even notice in, in my own life, you know, like I'll have an inspiration, but I won't necessarily follow through. And it's sort of like, well, what's that about? And I would, I would say most of the time it's not, I mean, you know, it take two seconds to do some of the things. I think it's more of being lazy and also afraid of how will the person respond or how will it be received or just even making that connection with somebody that maybe you don't know. Yeah. It's a lot safer for people to do that 
virtually and online than it is in person. Oh, yeah, because, you know, <laughs> you might have to talk to somebody. <laughs> yes. Look them in the eye, see their response Ooh. in real time. Yeah, it's a whole different game, right? <laughs> well, and I wanted to touch on this too. I mean, there's so much that the journal offers, and we're not covering everything, but you, you know, you have a section that talks about the things that we're doing today and the things we're yep. going to do tomorrow. And you talk about my top priorities. Was there a reason that when you put that in there, you thought, okay, this is, uh, I'm putting it in here because people need to focus on it. What were some of the reasons behind that? Yeah, so for the tomorrow, and, and as you notice, the the prompts for tomorrow vary. There's some different variations through it. They're all similar. Um, the, the thing with the top priorities, again, very intentional with it was that uh, this was for myself initially, and again, then using it with other people is that where a lot of the chaos was also stemming from was, like I said before, is just trying to do too much in one day. And so when I would stop and ask myself and and kind of pre-plan, like, okay, so for tomorrow, I've got this long to-do list on my desk or in my phone or on my computer, and there's a ton of things on there. But if I actually stop and say, you know, tomorrow, my top priority is to get these things done. If I get nothing else done, what will it feel good for me to get these three things checked off? That it becomes an ability, again, to just to focus the attention on what's the most important because a lot of times we'll default to kind of the easiest thing for us to take care of um, or the thing that shows up right in front of us or in our inbox versus really us directing. And, again, that whole tomorrow piece is really giving people an opportunity to be intentional about the experience they want to have, the attention they want to put towards getting stuff done. Um, you know, one of the prompts, as you saw, is around you know maybe a courageous conversation that you need to have, um, of being really intentional about, okay, how am I going to handle tomorrow if something stressful comes up? So that day is is very intentional <laughs> about helping you live more intentionally on a day to day basis. Oh, that makes perfect sense because when we do plan out our day, we have a plan. You yes. know, at least we have a plan to move forward regardless if we get everything done on our list or just one thing. Yeah. And I think for a lot of people, if they actually sat down and wrote down everything that they thought they were going to get done in the next day and tried to fit it into a calendar, like an actual schedule, what they would see is it's not actually humanly possible. So that's why part of this is, like, just pick – a few things for tomorrow. You can always do more if you get those done, but start with what what really is going to feel good or absolutely needs to get done for tomorrow and just focus on those in terms of calling them out in the journal so that they're kind of top of your mind. Mm, I love that. You know, you also offer coaching. You do... um, you work with corporations and companies and you do keynote speaking. Where can people connect with you and learn about all the services you offer and, of course, your book, Calm the Chaos? Great. Well, they can – probably the best place is to go to my website, with which is Nicola Taggart, N-I-C-O-L-A, T-A-G-G-A-R-T dot com, and that's got information about me and the services that I offer and also a a simple way to get in touch. I also have a business Facebook page, um, and then just this year, in conjunction with the journal, started a um, Calm the Chaos Today Facebook page, which has been getting a lot of response from people um, really from all over the world that are, you know, responding to to how to calm the chaos in their own life. So there's various ways for you to kind of get in touch with me, but also just get some additional tools and support in calming the chaos in your own life. Well, Nicola, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thank you so much for having me. It was such a pleasure. Well, thank you, Nicola. It has been such a pleasure to spend this time with you and, of course, to talk about your new journal, Calm the Chaos. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You've been listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. (laughs) 
In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Thursday, Friday, and Sunday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Mountain Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmaryann.com for more information.